Hi, it's Kirby Summers, and I welcome you to my true crime podcast. Today is December 24th. Uh, it is Christmas Eve. And so for those of you who celebrate, like me, <laughs> Merry Christmas. We're also in the middle of Hanukkah. And for those of you who celebrate Hanukkah, happy, happy holidays. You know, next week, it's the beginning of a new year. So um, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, before I get started, I've decided to ask you to please like the video, like the video and subscribe. Um, let me see if this is working. Testing, testing, testing. I believe it is. And so I'm going to continue. Um, sometimes, you, you know, you never know if this stuff is really working or not, but I think it is. Uh, I wasn't going to do a podcast today uh, because I'm still, believe it or not, I am still trying to recuperate from COVID. It's been uh, almost a month. Uh, it, I've had some days that are better than others. Uh, however, what I have been able to do for the most part is write. Um, so I want to bring you up to date to with my... Um, my most recent uh, articles for Substack and for my Epstein Project newsletter. And so here's the thing. My goal, and I think I just tweeted it early this morning, is that um, I want to keep the Epstein and Maxwell story alive. I, I want to do this because knowledge is power. Uh, this case has opened a certain window, if you will, into how blackmail has been used to hijack our politicians to create, um, let's say, positions of power where someone has been put into who basically did not belong in that spot. It has had major ramifications. It did not begin during World War II as other researchers seem to claim it has. Uh, it began long before World War II. I believe that the trafficking rings, and I know I say it all the time, but I'm gonna say it again, the trafficking rings are all part of the same monster. Usually I call it a tree with a lot of branches and a lot of undergrowth and they're all interconnected. But that is the way it looks to me. Um, even though everyone who reports on one or another continues to insist, no, this is a standalone. I dispute that with every fiber of my being, they're interconnected. Um, and so my, my goal is to continue to keep this story alive with your help in order to make this world a better place for our children and our grandchildren. Um, and I think that there is no one who doesn't want to make this world a better place. If you are following me, you will know that I lost my account uh, in November, uh, over a little over a month ago. Uh, there's one person on my um, Landlord Links account who, for reasons unknown to me, said, gee, I don't see that many people following you, and I don't see that many people responding. Duh. You know, if you see me having, like, just shy of a 1,000 people following me on this account that I've had since 2012 that I didn't really use and I'm using it now and you don't see me on the one that I had almost 35,000 even though I blocked about 100,000 people then and, and it's really even a different name although my name Kirby Summers is there I don't see how this person can't put one and one together and figure out you're following me on a different account it, nevertheless I'm at landlordlinks.net. I also created an account on Mastodon. 
and on another platform post where I'm going to keep putting out information through that. Primarily, I am going to be using my two newsletters, the Epstein Project and my um, account on Substack. Both of these, you know, I'm sort of like, the more I know, like, for example, I'm just going to read to you a private email I received from Professor Hamamoto. So I sent him a little holiday greeting. And um, I'm just going to read like a sentence or two from this. He's like, um, all we can do is keep working and your reports keep be getting better and better. The most recent substack that goes in on John Mitchell and the Tricky Dick cohort was excellent, despite the fact that I was sick, obviously. And so, yeah, you know, the one that I just did for um, Substack basically goes in on the fact that Jeffrey Epstein said to reporters that um, he met Stephen Hoffenberg through the Attorney General of the United States, John Mitchell, even though um, Hoffenberg claimed that it was through Douglas Lease. Now, what I did was I copied some stuff here so that I could read it to you. I'm trying to find it as we speak. Um, so just give me one second to see if I can get to that because when I'm on Zoom, which is where I'm on right now, it doesn't really let me do a lot. So let me just see if I can just pull something up. Bear with me. You won't be disappointed. Okay. I found it. <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. The title of the piece on Substack, which I suggest you all read because it's just part one. I was going to do only two parts, but every time I delve into one of these nooks and crannies, I find so much more information and, and I would rather share what I find with you than sort of skip over it and just keep it narrow. Um, I, I do notice that that is the preferred way of some people to work to sort of keep the story as narrow as possible, specifically when it comes to mainstream. And there there's a stuff that I want to discuss with you about mainstream that you probably know but it doesn't help, it doesn't uh, hurt, I'm sorry, to be reminded. Uh, and I'll do that after I discuss a little bit about um, this Mitchell character who keeps popping up in my research. So John Mitchell was, was a good friend of Richard Nixon uh, long before Nixon ever ran for uh, becoming the president of the United States. I mean, they were such good friends that they each had a, they were both lawyers and they each had their own practice and they were such good friends that they linked their practices uh, together. And then of course, the rest is written in history. Nixon ran for office and Mitchell was appointed as his attorney general. What most people don't know about uh, this selection of Mitchell is that typically when uh, a president elect selects an attorney general, there's a background check on that person. Uh, in fact, there's a background check whenever an, a, 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 a selected president starts to tap people on the shoulder for specific 
roles. In this particular case, Nixon went to the director of the FBI at the time who would have performed the necessary background check and told him, hey, I, I, I don't want you to do this for Mitchell. There's a reason for that, right? I mean, had the normal background check been done on John Mitchell, it would have disqualified him from office. And um, when I did some digging into Mitchell's background, that would have been his intense connection to the underworld. But frankly, Nixon had connections to the underworld. So did Hoover. But let's get back to Mitchell for the time being. Mitchell is linked to numerous blackmail child trafficking rings. And Epstein is really just another incarnation of these rings that have popped up and popped up and popped up. And in some cases, the CIA will come in and say, hey, don't look at this, and it's buried. So that happens with the finders. If you know anything about the finders, uh, that was where there were two men who were stopped in Florida. There were about six children in the van. The children were in a state of, they were like feral children. They didn't really know how to speak properly. They were very little. They were not dressed uh, clean. They were soiled, you know, and it made the news. And, and, and in no time, the CIA said, shut this down. It's an internal matter. Well, Mitchell is connected to all of these rings. He, he's connected to um, Roy Cohn. He was friendly with Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn is a known child trafficker. Mitchell knew and was friendly with child trafficker Craig Spence, who I go into in this Substack newsletter, which is basically titled The Connection Between Jeffrey Epstein and Craig Spence. Mitchell knew and was friendly with child trafficker Larry King. Larry King, not of the uh, television show, but Larry King of the Franklin cover-up. Mitchell knew and was friendly with child trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. There's a saying in the intelligence community, and that is that nothing is a coincidence. So I do not believe that John Mitchell uh, was just coincidentally connected to these rings. Moreover, few people know that John Mitchell also took part in Roy Cohn's child trafficking ring, um, which he ran with Louis Rosensteel. Rosensteel, I'm giving you just an overall uh, view of what I wrote for like really detailed information. I suggest you become a member of my Substack and read the article. All of the articles I have put up there and there are a lot of them that I've put up there have new information that certainly mainstream will never cover. And a lot of indie media people for reasons unknown to me have not gone near, but I go into all of it. And the reason I do is because I find it um, almost incredulous that I was a small part, a little cog in the wheel, if you will, as the sex slave to a person, an elite, you know, for lack of a better term, that belonged to this group of like very sinister characters who basically repeat generation after generation. So to give you an example of how they repeat generation after generation, I can use the example of the presidency of the United States. So every four years, we have 
what are supposed to be elections. I'm not going to even go into the election thing and it being rigged and all that, but we go into these elections where we, the people, supposedly elect a new president every four years. The terms are like, sometimes you have a one-term president. The max term for a president is two terms. And so we elect a new president so that the position of president of the United States is the same, but the faces and the names change. And that is how you should look at the child trafficking rings, which I want to make sure you understand that even though I say they're child trafficking rings, they also include people of age like myself. Okay, I was trafficked and I was a sex slave and I was of age. And so let's say somebody like Sarah Ransom, who is a known victim of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, she too was of age. And then there are men who were of age, who were used by, let's say, Craig Spence. They were used by Larry King. They were used by others because the way, the way it works, and I'm just going to make a small detour and I'll circle back to Mitchell in a second. The way it works is you have to have of age um, people that are trafficked. Uh, in order to ensnare the powerful. And the powerful come from different walks of life. They're powerful in the military. They're powerful in politics. They're powerful in business. And they're powerful not just within the borders of the United States, but borderless throughout the world. So for example, my my story on... Craig Spence and Jeffrey Epstein is going to take us to another continent and another time that I'm not going to spoil for you in part two. Um, but it starts with you come to a party in a very nice house. The house is bugged with cameras and they're taping and there's drugs and there's booze. And before you know it, somebody's taking off their clothing and it turns into an orgy. In some cases, there's the option to go into a bedroom if you prefer your privacy and you're the one that's being targeted. But there are cameras in there too. So some people have a preference for people of age. However, what happens is that once you become accustomed to going to these parties, very similar to the parties that Jeffrey Epstein gave in his multiple homes and on his island, very similar to the parties that Craig Spence gave, very similar to the parties that Larry King took his victims to. Once you become accustomed to going to these parties and having orgies, the minors are also there. And so pretty soon, even if you don't go into it as a, a selected uh, target of the blackmail scheme, you two are having sex with a minor. And so now you're compromised, right? You're compromised because in many cases, um, you're having sex with someone who is of the same sex. So you're having sex with a minor boy. And so you don't report this crime. This crime is a crime that is unreported. It's unreported because there's shame attached to it. You will lose your position, uh, whether it be in government or in the military, or you're running a, a large corporation that is used by what I consider to be the intelligence over um, sort of like, uh, for, for, for to make it simple, I'm gonna say the CIA. And when I say the CIA, I cannot, I cannot say CIA without including the fact that the Mossad is a sister agency of the CIA. So that um, 
getting back to John Mitchell, he was friends with all of these uh, child traffickers. And again, I do not see that as being a, a coincidence. Um, therefore, I am inclined to believe Jeffrey Epstein when he said it was John Mitchell who introduced him to Stephen Hoffenberg, even though Hoffenberg said it was Lees. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure that Epstein knew Lees, but I think it was Craig Spence. So for those of you who are unaware of how the media, and the media means the newscasters, the initial three television stations that we had in the United States, CBS, ABC, NBC, our music. So somebody like um, the big music mogul that we've had uh, sort of behind all the music. Um, what's his name? What's his name? God, you know, sometimes doing a podcast this early in the morning is difficult. But um, so we have somebody like Clive Davis, right, who began his career uh, for CBS. CBS was basically just an arm of the CIS. And all we need to do to confirm that is to take a look at the church committee hearings of 1975, where basically uh, Sig Miggleson, uh, who was president of CBS News in the 50s, said that by the time he, be he had been working at CBS, but by the time he became the head of the CBS news agency, that they there was already a an existing um, plan within the agency where it was known that they cooperated with the CIA sharing information that was given to them. Um, the church committee hearing also interviewed the director of the CIA, William Bill Colby. And so I'm just gonna read to you an excerpt of that hearing. So the, the question posed by Senator Church was, do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation, like an, a, a major American journal? And the answer to that uh, by Colby uh, was we do have people who submit pieces to American journals. And then Church uh, poses another question. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing? I'm sorry, do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? And then Colby responds, I think this gets into the kind of ah, uh, he starts to pause, hem and haw, uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. So he's basically telling uh, Senator Ch uh, uh, Church, Frank Church, that he doesn't want to answer this in front of the cameras. He doesn't want to answer it publicly because it'll go on the record. He's telling him that he wants to answer this question privately and basically not answer it at all. And so the next question uh, by Church was, do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to the national news services, the Associated Press and the UPI? And so again, Colby comes back with, well, again, I think we're getting into the kind of detail, Mr. Chairman, that I prefer to handle at executive session. So it's, it's, it's very easy to see that these relationships were ongoing and to underscore the fact that they were ongoing, I want to bring your attention to a book that was written a very long time ago called 
Catherine the Great. Uh, it was written by, let's see if I can find her name, but it's Catherine the Great, written by a former Village Voice journalist by the name of Deborah David. And uh, basically, she wrote about the connection between uh, the Washington Post, in particular, Catherine being the wife of Philip Graham, who was the then publisher of the Washington Post. And upon his suicide, his wife, Catherine Graham, uh, became the Washington Post uh, publisher. Uh, mind you, that's up to it. Although she wasn't named as a successor to her husband when he became, when he basically committed suicide. However, in this book, which is a, a wonderful expose by Dave, De Deborah David, again, it's a biographical sketch of the publisher, Catherine Graham, and it focuses specifically on the clandestine, on, on the secret connections between the CIA and the Washington Post. I want to remind you that it was the Washington Post who theoretically broke open the Watergate story, okay? So that not everything you read in mainstream media is exactly what happened because mainstream media has only given you the story that the CIA has approved. What happened with this book was uh, that when it was published, there was a, a major lawsuit and the book was removed from the shelves as a result of Catherine Graham suing the publisher. And now the reason she sued the publisher is because everything was right. And so what the author, Deborah Davis, did is she found a smaller publisher who went ahead and published the book anyway. Um, and so it's, it's uh, in Catherine the Great, Davis quoted a former CIA agent who discussed meeting Philip Graham, in which they conferred about the availability and prices of journalists. And I'm going to read the quote to you. Um, you can get a journalist cheaper than a good call girl for a couple of hundred dollars a month. And so... <sighs> Basically, he was comparing the price of a journalist to prostitution, but pretty much it denigrates the profession of prostitutes because most prostitutes are not willing to destroy a life uh, when turning a trick, right? But but many journalists will gladly destroy a life to land a story. Uh, and so... By the early 1950s, Davis wrote in Catherine the Great, Wisner owned respected members of the New York Times, Newsweek, CBS, and other communication vehicles, plus stringers. There were about four to 600 of these call stringers. Um, and so, and you know, and, and she also noted that Philip Graham stocked the Washington Post with writers and editors who had intelligence backgrounds. So that you have basically CIA agents working in these newsrooms, giving the American people stories. Um, and so, again, let me just circle back to um, part one of my story on Substack where 
I go into um, John Mitchell and his connection to these trafficking rings. The other thing that I sort of bring to mind, which nobody else had, was that J. Edgar Hoover, we know that he had a number two guy that he was having this like lifelong affair with, Clyde Tolson. But what you don't know is that, um, and again, you know, I have to find my notes for this. So, okay, so what I described, when I described uh, the CIA being in bed with, let's say, the Washington Post, Catherine Graham, and that includes Ben Bradley, it includes the, quote, boys who broke the Watergate story, that's all falls under Operation Mockingbird, okay? Um, and you, you know about Operation Mockingbird. And the only reason we know about Operation Mockingbird, just to refresh your memory, is because in 1973, a document referred to as Family Jewels was given to uh, Seymour Hersh, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, who had broken uh, several top stories about what was happening in Vietnam. And he went ahead and he wrote a story for the New York Times on the illegal activities, illegal. I can't underscore the word illegal, that the CIA was performing on US citizens. Now remember, the CIA does not have the mandate to work in the United States, but so they were performing all kinds of things that were made public because of Seymour Hersh writing an article or two in the New York Times. Now, just to give you a, a frame of reference, the New York Times was read by middle class and upper class people only. It didn't filter down. It wasn't meant for poor people, struggling families. The struggling people and poor families were relegated to reading newspapers like the Daily News, which is probably why Robert Maxwell purchased it, and maybe the New York Post, which is probably why Rupert Murdoch purchased it. Um, but it was it was written in the New York Times. And so when it was written in, in the New York Times, it caught the attention of the middle class person and the person who had more than average means. And so they became incensed, which is the only reason we had a church committee hearing. Now, I will be writing a piece on that hearing at some future date because that, too, was tampered with in a way that I'm not gonna spoil for you right now. Um, so, I, you know, I'm going over the time that I wanted to spend on this, but sometimes, you know, we just have to dig in when the digging is happening. And so, um, I also go into um, Rachel Chandler's history. And I've been doing this in my Epstein Project newsletter, which I always say it, but I'm gonna say it, it's in its fourth year, which is mind boggling for me. And thank you to all of you who have supported me in my Epstein Project newsletter. I, when I began it shortly after starting my work on Epstein and company in July of 2019, it, it was sort of like a lark. I didn't know about newsletters. I didn't know it was quote, the new thing. I just wanted to um, give my followers more information than I could in a tweet because I was always cognizant of the fact that I could not really share 
Um, so for example, if you, at that time, if you wrote uh, Rachel Handler's, I'm sorry, Rachel Chandler's name on a tweet, your account got suspended. And so Rachel Chandler uh, was a, um, let's call her a co, um, she worked with Epstein in a way that is largely unknown. She was also connected to Nexium. Typically, most people believe that the only social light that was connected to Jeffrey Epstein was Glenn Maxwell. That's not the case. There were many socialites connected to Jeffrey Epstein long before Glenn Maxwell entered the picture uh, at the time that her father died in 1991. So we're talking about the end of 1991 because Robert Maxwell didn't fall or was pushed off his yacht until November 5th of 1991, at which point that's when uh, Galen came into the picture. But prior to Galen coming into the picture, Epstein was surrounded by very wealthy people. Remember, he already was connected with Leslie Wexner, one of the billionaires of the world, one of the wealthiest men of the world. But he was also connected to other socialites. And so one of these socialites is Rachel Chandler. And what I when uh, the Balenciaga scandal arose, and it was revealed that Chandler, who became quote a photographer, uh, and owns a company called Midland Agency, and who had on her Instagram a lot of disturbing photographs of children who looked like they were trafficked, and frankly. I bet you they were trafficked because all of this or a lot of this happens right before our very eyes, but the public is tuned into being so incredulous. Like, it, this looks like this could be that, but we can't believe it because it's so far over the top. And that's what I write in Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy, that let's say, for example, we have somebody like Virginia Dufre telling her friends that she just had uh, an intimate relationship with a prince, and in this case, Prince Andrew. And so the story seems so far-fetched and so out of the normal that most people say, well, you must be lying, or you must be exaggerating, or this must be at your fantasy because it's too out of the ordinary for me to believe that this takes place. Well, as it turns out, it does take place, okay? And it's it's not far-fetched. Once we've heard and we've seen documentation showing, let's say, for example, Virginia Dufre with Prince Andrew. And before that, we had Naomi, um, one of the models that I discussed in my book, Ghislaine Maxwell, an unauthorized biography, uh, who was connected with um, the son of the ruler of Monaco. Um, and she too, Karen Mulder, she too exposed on French television that she was turned into a prostitute and that she was trafficked to politicians and to other people. Now, the the trafficking ring that Karen Mulder tried to expose, uh, she exposed Gerard Marie, Jean-Luc Brunel, and we know from that that they too are connected to Epstein. So to get back to Rachel Chandler, what I decided to do was I decided to just go back into her life into her history, into the origins of her family. And I did this in part one of Chasing Chandler, which is in my Epstein Project newsletter. Uh, this Tuesday, there'll be part two of Chasing Chandler. And initially, you know, I, I think I start thinking, okay, you know, I I might be able to put all the information in maybe a two-part series 
but I believe that my series on the connection between Jeffrey Epstein and Craig Spence on my Substack might go into three parts instead of two, because there's a lot of information that I want to share with you that takes us again into another continent. And it brings everything full circle. And then the same things, you know, I'm, I'm encountering the same thing as I'm writing the Chasing Chandler part two, because I keep discovering more and more horrors, you know, and so that by the time we get to our time, right, by the time we get to the time, and let's call it the time where Jeffrey Epstein is finally arrested in July of 2019, there's so much that has happened historically that only reinforces, let's say, Epstein's ideas on eugenics, that reinforces the fact that he wanted to um, impregnate, and we know that he wanted to impregnate Virginia Dufre. Let's use her as an example, because most of you are aware about this. But mainstream media goes on to say that, well, he never really did this. I don't believe that because um, I do know of a story where Glenn Maxwell, and I will probably be including this in part two or maybe part three of Chasing Chandler in my Epstein Project newsletter. I know that Glenn Maxwell took one of these pre-selected girls, I'm gonna call them girls because at the time they were young, to become the carrier of Epstein's seed. And she was livid that the girl didn't see how special she was to have been selected. And it was another girl, not, not um, Virginia that I'm referring to. Um, so that I believe that whomever he did impregnate would not step forward because these people are then embedded into our society, just like in Rachel Chandler's life, she was part of our world, right? Before we knew that she was part of such a, like, like this, like this nightmare of a world that few of us knew coexisted with our lives. Um, you know, sexual blackmail did not begin with Jeffrey Epstein. It did not end with Jeffrey Epstein. It precedes World War II. And um, it's something that in order for us to beat, we have to know about. We have to know about the nooks and crannies of this world. We have to know how to spot the people who are involved. We have to know when, for example, um, I'll give you an example. So, and then I'll, I'll close this because it has been a long podcast. So for example, uh, the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, was not only compromised himself with blackmail, but he had blackmail on everybody. And one of those people that he had blackmail on was John F. Kennedy. And so when John F. Kennedy was um, running for president, Hoover blackmailed him into selecting Johnson. Johnson was not the person that Kennedy was gonna tap on the shoulder. It was another man entirely but he was blackmailed into selecting Johnson as his running mate. And that completely changed history. But what it also did was it showed that um, there was a hijacking, literally a hijacking of the second most powerful seat in the US government. Few people know this, but you know this now. With that, I'm gonna, ask you to please like the video, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. I will leave um, some information 
uh, below so that you can follow me on my other platforms. And I will say um, happy holidays to all. Let's keep this story going. Let's keep the information uh, coming out. Share the information with your family and your friends because knowledge is power, okay? Let's go into 2023 with the newfound knowledge that few of us knew about before. Even me, I was connected to this world and I didn't know how dirty it was until I started to dig in looking for answers for myself. All right, everybody, happy holidays, happy new year, enjoy your weekend, bye.